course, Scott Sargent has joined us from um, well, one time MOD guitarist and, of course, uh, Laz Rocket guitarist. How are you going? Oh, you know, man. <laughs> I don't have all the hair like I used to have back in the day. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, and, uh, you be I, had it when I, it. I had it when I needed it. You don't need long hair anymore. Nah. Look, not at our age anyway. I, I don't know how old you are, but um, I'm on the other side of 50 now. Yeah, and, me too. Um, and, 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 you know, long hair just doesn't work anymore. For me. Yeah. Like I, I, I tell my friends, I have, a, I have, I have some ball busting friends, man, that, you know, and, and, you know, and I say, man, even if I could grow hair, which I can't anymore, other than the, the shit on my face, uh, uh, even if I could grow it, I don't even know if I would because it would be so weird to fucking have hair after not having hair for 20 something years, <laughs> you know, so I mean, I'm 55, you know, and uh, so I think I started losing my hair somewhere around 35, somewhere around there is when I started going, okay, shit's happening here. And I wasn't one of those people that held on for dear life. You know, I wasn't like, oh, my God. No. <laughs> I just kind of said, OK, well, fuck it, you know, and and just dealt with it, you know. But uh, but the, the whole dy music dynamic, that whole thing of, you know, uh, you know, having all the hair to go with all the metal and all that shit at that time. So we're talking, you know, uh, 35, 20 years ago. So yeah, we're looking at right, right. We're crossing into the millennium. You know, you didn't, you didn't need it. You know, there were, uh, you know, it was a different dynamic. So, well, and look, and, and I guess it's up to you whether you want to be that, um, that dude with the receding or ball patch with length and a few strands that just kind of hang on to the back of your back. They kind yeah. of glue. Um, yeah, it was, uh, who was it? It was Devin Townsend. Devin Townsend did that for a while. He and he did. told, he, he, he told me, he goes, you know what? I don't care, man. He goes, he, ca he called it a skullet. He says, I, I, <laughs> I'm starting a new trend. It's called a skullet. <laughs> I was like, do each his own. You can do your thing. I personally could, I didn't have the balls to do it, but Devin, if anybody could do it, Devin would be the guy that would do it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we're not here really to talk about um, here, though, are we? We're here to talk about your... Going back a couple of weeks ago, just out of nowhere, a good friend of mine, Francis, posted a video um, and I just happened to click on it and um, have a listen. It was like, holy shit, it, it absolutely blew me away. It, um, it was like, what am I listening to here? Am I listening to, um, am I listening to Discharge? Am I listening to Disfear? With a little bit of um, motorhead thrown in for uh, good measure. I just, it wasn't quite, I didn't know what was going on. Um, I had to quickly... Uh, scroll through to see um, who it was and do you want to let the uh, people out there know um, exactly what your new project is? Yeah, um, so I'm calling the project Tales of Ethereum. Um, basically what it was is I, I, I was, you know, we had the whole COVID lockdowns and I saw everybody was doing these videos, you know, all these different musicians were doing these collaborative videos and they were doing covers of bands and things like that. And there's, you know, obviously there was a lot of really cool ones, you know, um, there were some that went like whatever, but, but anyway, the, the point, being, the point being is that um, I thought, well, wouldn't that be cool? Cause I've got so many friends from all the years of touring, you know, I was like, wouldn't it be cool to do something with some of my friends, but I wanted to do something different. I said, I thought instead of doing, um, doing a, a cover of a, of a band, I thought, what if I was to actually write a song? that was an influence, like my interpretation of an influence of, a, of one of my favorite bands. Yep. And so, so, and Celtic Frost is like one of my favorite and early influences. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to write a song. Basically, if I was that, you know, that other member of Celtic Frost, you know, so writing a song for Celtic Frost. And so I thought that that would be a cool, a cool concept instead of just playing a cover song to do that. And, uh, and so I wrote the song and then when I had the music done, uh, I was like, okay, who am I going to pull into this? 
And then I just start thinking about friends of mine that I know are going to be able to compliment it and who are also Celtic frost heads, you know. Um, and so the first person I, I, uh, I got a hold of was Jorgen Sandstrom, mm-hmm. um, who was the original singer for Grave mm-hmm. uh, and was the bass player in Intuned. And he's got a bunch of other bands. He's got another one called Dome to Gone that's just amazing. But uh, so I got a hold of him. I said, hey, you want, you want to sing on this? And he said, send it to me. Let me check it out. And I sent it to him. He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, totally. And, I, and, and then I explained to him the thing about the Celtic Frost idea and everything. And so he goes, OK, so that's why you got the oof. You know, you got that at the beginning. And, you know, and there's been some little other drops lyrically in there, um, you know, that we even the name of the band is a, is amalgamation of uh, uh, Megatherian and, and, and Morbid Tales. So yep. Tales of Therian, you know. Um, yeah. so, um, so then, so then he sent me back, he got the vocals done and he sent it back to me. And then I was like, Oh shit, this is awesome. And I go, now I got to find the other two guys, which was going to be the drummer and the bass player. And so, um, I called Danny Lilker, who's an old friend of mine, you know, um, I toured with SOD on a couple of the reunion tours back in around 2000. And so I called him up and I said, hey, man, you know, would you be down playing on this? I think, you know, it's totally up your alley. He's a total Celtic head. Yep. And so Danny, in true Danny fashion, was like, yeah, sure, yeah, sure man, send it to me, you know. <laughs> and uh, and me and Danny actually wrote some music together back around 2000 that just never saw the light of day. So we already kind of had that thing, you know. And then... Uh, and then the last, the last piece of the puzzle was the drums. And, um, and I was, you know, I, wa- I wanted to work with this certain drummer, but he was going to, he was so busy and he always has all these bands and then he was getting ready to go on this big tour. And then all of a sudden the tour got canceled. And I was like, holy shit. And that was when I made the call to Will Carroll from Death Angel. And uh, me and I've known Will since he was like 16. Oh, uh, wow. Yep. And so I called Will and I said, hey, man. And I sent him the song. And he was just like, totally. And so so there you have it. I mean, I had all the guys who were totally down to do it. And um, so at that point, it was just all about getting it recorded. And um, so I flew out uh, to the Bay Area. I live in Austin, Texas. I've been out here for about 18 years. But I uh, flew out to the Bay Area. And Will met me at my friend's studio, Juan Urtiaga, who's who's a, a Bay Area, you know, he's the the go-to Purdue Bay Area producer guy, Machine Head, Testament, Exodus. I mean, he does all that, all those bands. And uh, he's an old friend of mine. So uh, so I went out there, recorded the drums with Will, um, came back to Texas, did my guitars, sent it to Danny. Danny did his bass. He lives in Rochester, New York. Then mm-hmm. I sent it. Then I sent it to Jorgen, who's in Stockholm, Sweden. You know, and so we just all did our things, and then they send all their stuff back to me, and and then I get everything done, and then I give it all to Juan, and then Juan mixes it, and and during this whole time of getting everything tracked, I was doing putting together the video, the visualizer video. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was doing that. I was doing that with my friend Brian. We were using the demo music for it, but we were putting that all together. So as soon as the music would be done, I go, "Okay, let's just slap the the the, the music, the new music, onto the video, and we'll be done with it. And we could put everything out." And so that's how I did everything. I mean, it was it was a pretty busy, it was a pretty busy month or so, uh, you know, coordinating with everybody and and doing all that. But finally, got it done. And it came this, oh, it's come up uh, f- fantastic. Even the clip um, is uh, spot on. Uh, it's um, it's it's extremely haunting. It's um, it's it's quite good. It's almost like a little horror movie, but it's uh, but it's very very cool. Um, but isn't it interesting that in the twenty first century we no longer rely we need to rely on flying people in to record? Everything is just gone. You really don't need to be in the same room anymore. Um, to cal- collaborate or, or to, uh, to record anything, which is pretty cool. Well, you know, there's so with anything, 
you have the negatives and the positives. So, yeah, you know, um, yeah, it's awesome that I can record a song and get parts done with guys from all over the world. And, uh, you know, and, and I can, I can coordinate it enough and get it all done and, and do it. That's great. Um, I, you know, of course, when you're in situations where you actually, like with this song, I pretty much had already wrote the music. So then it was just about getting my friends to, you know, play, play on it, except for Jorgen. Jorgen wrote his lyrics and his vocal patterns to the music. So, you know, we're yeah. the two writers, really, where yeah. Will and Danny, even though they were playing what the, how the song was written, they obviously, they brought in their flavor to it, too. You know, Danny, play, Danny is Danny. I mean, there's no getting around that sound of his. And, you know, and that was imperative for me you know with him i was like look i need i want that sound i want your style i want that i want it to be able to people to hear it and and know that you know that's him and will you know he you know yeah i gave him the song and it, but he came up with this ideas he came up with his his drum ideas and uh so so we, being able to do it that way, and this is the first time I've ever done this, you know, trying to write a song or not write a song, but trying to get it all done with people everywhere, scattered everywhere, as opposed to being in a room with dudes. Yep. And, you know, and that's where, you know, being in a room with dudes, what you know, that there's a whole other, you know, dynamic that happens with that. Um, that's that I think is really beneficial to um, creating vibe. Um, and on this song, I was like, man, am I going to be able to, am I going to be able to get that vibe, you know, because everything's going to be sent from here and there and blah, blah. But you know what, man, I, it, it happened. It's the vibe is there. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just, I don't know how it happened but it happened and uh it was so cool man and and, and i guess isn't it interesting that you, you're it, it, it is really you mentioned celtic frost earlier i don't hear celtic frost in it at all other than in the title of the band really yeah no i hear a lot of really um early 80s punk wow well you know everybody you know everybody's gonna interpret it a certain way and i and, you know, every guy that I sent it to that did this recording or even guys outside, just friends of mine, I immediately hear the Celtic Cross, you know, um, and, you know, but and I think that's, you know, for me, it, it's important to have to know the backstory because Absolutely. like you said, like, you, you didn't hear it, you know, so and I, I'm sure that a lot of people are going to, you know, hear, you know, because, yeah, you can, you know. Motorhead, I can, you know, the same bands that you mentioned, yeah, I can hear that in there, you know, but if you know the backstory, you're just going to kind of, once you know the backstory and then you listen to it, you're going to go, okay, all right, you know, now, now I see what he's saying. Um, and I'll be, and I'll be honest, I've gone into this without in looking at any backstory or even um, other than you telling me um, earlier. Uh, who was in the band? So for me, this is um, eyes wide open sort of stuff, sort of stuff, I should say, right. which is which is really good. Um, it gives you a different a different view, I suppose. Yeah, and 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 like I said, I mean, to me, that the the concept of writing a song, paying homage to a band that influenced you in your younger years, in your impressionable years, when you're just starting to play Absolutely. and write, and then to be able to go, hey, you know, instead of playing Procreation of the Wicked or Into the Crypts of Rays or, you know, uh, Dethroned or whatever. I mean, uh, you know, it's it, it, uh, to write something and going, hey, you know, like I kind of did it, I kind of did this before with uh, MOD. Yeah, um, we did uh, the last record that I did with MOD was in 2008, and we did a song called "The Greatest Lie Ever Told," 
And when we were writing that, Billy said, hey, I want to write this, but I want it to be like a Tenacious D, start, starts off like Tenacious D with acoustic guitar and all that. But then I want to, because the story, the way the story was that there was a, an evil presence, you know, to the story. And, and he goes, he goes, let's have the evil presence be King Diamond. And I said, okay, so what I'm going to do, <laughs> I go, I go, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the music, like as, as if I was writing riffs for Merciful Fate. And so <laughs> now you hear the riffs and you immediately feel that Merciful Fate vibe, but none of those riffs are are identical or anything to any merciful fate riffs yeah once again it was me going okay merciful fate called me up and said hey scott can you write some some riffs and those would be the riffs that i would write yeah, it's very cool concept, the same kind of concept but years ago you know yeah, with yeah, that well, yeah. In. so where to for um tales of ethereum Say again? Where to for Tales of, of Ethereum? Um, well, so far, um, you know, like I said, it's it's in the infant stage right now. This is a, this is a recording project. This isn't um, anything that I, you know, is going to, you know, tour extensively. Um, shit, I don't even know if we're going to do more songs. We might. Um, uh, the guys, you know, uh, since I put it out. Um, you know, the reaction I've gotten, I've, the message, I've gotten messages and calls from people saying, hey, you need to do more. Mm. And, um, you know, so, so, and, and Will and Jorgen have both been like, hey, you know, look, you know, I'm down to do more if you want to do some more, you know, you know, but I'm just, I'm, I'm just kind of like, well, let's see what happens with this. Let's see how, you know, the what the reception is like for this. And, um, and then we'll cross that bridge if we if if it, if we get to it, you know. I'm not opposed to doing anything. Um, I would love to, you know, got you twist my arm to write some more Celtic cross type shit. I mean, <laughs> I, I I I could do that all day long. Um, um, so, like I said, uh, you know, if something you know arises um, or it even just gets to a, a point where I say, hey, let's just do another song or two. Or I might even just say, fuck it, and let's just do another four songs and put out an EP. You mm -hmm. know, that, those things might happen, but I'm not really going to commit to anything until I see what's going on in, with this song. I, I mean, I've got other stuff going on, too, other projects that are in in very infantile stage right now. And so I'm just like, I'm just, I don't want to, you know, put all my eggs over here and not there, you know until I, I see that it's going to be beneficial. And I'm, and I, and I don't mean that like beneficial, like as in financially or anything like that, more so beneficial that, that people actually want it, that, that people actually want to hear. Cause it, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy um, to do this stuff, especially the way that I was explaining how this guy from Sweden, that guy from Rochester, you know, and doing it all like mm -hmm. that. It takes a lot of energy to to coordinate all of that, and you know, it's not like they send their stuff over, and, and I'm like, okay, that's great, thanks, and bye, and I'll I'll see you, at, you know, I'll talk to you later. It's like I I hear things, I'm like, okay, now like with Jorgen, I go, okay, send me this, and send me some of this, and send me that, and Danny Loker, I'd be like, hey, dude, you know, hey, can you do this and do that, you know? So I'm producing the song as you go via, via, you know messaging texting talking yeah you know and so you know and so when guys are you know have it like danny was like all right dude you know i've done i've done my bass like three times now <laughs> you know <laughs> I, really I don't want to take the fun out of it you know and i i, I totally understand that yep. but being being the uh the creator and the producer of the, this thing you know I, I just like man i gotta get what's in my ear i gotta get what's in my head you know, it's all got to be the way I want it to be, or I, you know, I'm not going to be happy. And um, so, and that's just that's just part of the, the the creative process. It's part of the recording process. It's just the way it is, you know. Yeah, and plus, we're on the other side of fifty too. Our patience is wearing thin. <laughs> yeah, well, 
Yeah, well, that, you know, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and people have, you know, lives, they have children, they have schedules, they, they, they have their own other projects. Like I said, Jorgen is, you know, in, I don't know how many bands he's got. Same with Danny Loker. The guy's always busy with something. He's got his family and doing his thing work-wise too. And Will's in Death Angel. And, and he has another, another guy that's in like, plays with a ton of different people. So it's like, you know, okay, yeah, you know, let's squeeze that. You know, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of coordination that has to happen to get this kind of stuff done. And so for me to do one song and it takes two months to do one song, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's you know, four songs. How long is that going to take? <laughs> well, you do have a life, I guess. And, um, and there's no expectation is there by the sounds of it. It'll right. be what it'll be. Exactly. You know, as long as I'm happy and that's what this was all about. I was like, dude, I want, I'm doing this for me. Granted, I wanted to, you know, when I, when I got it done, I wanted to put it out. That was the whole thing with the visualizer video too. I was mm -hmm. like, man, I want some, I want to assault two senses at one time, not just one. And so and I'm all, if I can, if I can get you here and here, you know, at one time, that'd be great. And so I was like, man, I really need some, a concept for the visualizer to like that creepy, cold horror thing to go with that music. And to me, they just are, they just, it blends perfectly with the song. You yeah, know, absolutely. That, yeah. Did you put that uh, visualizer together yourself? So I did it with my friend, Brian. Um, now he has a, he has a, his own production company called sticky graphics. And, um, but I, I, I had got a hold of him and we started talking about it and he says, okay, well, what do you want to do? And, and so the whole con the idea and the concept was definitely my idea. Um, you know, and I also did, um, uh, furnish quite a bit of footage. Uh, you know, I, mm -hmm. I would only just be scouring, you know, as much as I could and, he would get what he could and and, um, and then I would be like, oh, I, I want this part to be here. Like the bubble mouth guy, there's this part where the guy's like, oh, there's a bubble. And I'm all, that has to be where the guitar solo is and it has to be lined up perfect with this. And, you know, so yeah, um, it was, it was, it was both of us, but you know, yes, I was involved in that as well. It was just another thing I was, you know, I had to be, like I said, when, you know, when you're the cook, you know, you're the, you're the cook. And, you know, and that's exactly what it was. You know, I was like, okay, everything's got to be right. You guys got to give me the stuff I need, but I got to put it together. And it's got to be, it's got to taste the way that I want it to taste when it's done. You know, yeah. and so it, it had to be everything. Safe to say, um, we hope to hear another one, two, three, four, five songs um, in the future. And... If I can ask, uh, if I can just go back in your career a little bit and ask, you know, I had the pleasure of interviewing Billy Milano, I think. <laughs> Enigmatic character he is. Um, yeah. What was it like working with Billy and MOD? Well, um, so Billy is an old friend of mine. I, I met Billy in 1989. Um that was before I joined Los Rocket. Man, I met Billy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and we just started off on the. <laughs> I mean, I immediately cracked a joke at his expense. Was the first words that came out of my mouth. And he back in eighty, you know, he's always been a, a fairly, you know, a, most he, he intimidates a lot of people. Um, of course he does. And and. But but he he never did that with me. Like I, I was never intimidated by him. I respected him. I you know I love you know the work that he did. Sod. I mean, come on, um, you know. And uh, and then you know USA for Mod and and and, miscon and gross misconduct, which was the tour that I met him on was gross misconduct. And um, so so I immediately cracked a joke because I'm just an incorrigible and smart ass i've just always <laughs> been that way and so that's how we met and um and it was just it was really cool and funny and and then after that uh you know he there was a there was a moment where i almost joined mod like in 94 93 or 94 
um, for the Rhythm of Fear record. Okay. And he called, he, he called me and said, hey, you know, would you be interested in this? And, and he goes, but you got to move, you got to move to New York. And, um, and at that time, of course, I'm living in the Bay Area. And I'm like, you know, I go, I go, I don't know about that. And he goes, well, I can't afford to fly you out all the time. And, and I go, well, I don't want to live in New York. So let's just say no to that right now. Um, but, but we always stayed in contact. And, um, and then he co-managed one of my bands. I had a band called Killing Culture. I did one record. Um, he helped co-manage that for a, for a while. And then I did Skin Lab. And that's when I, you know, I came out to Australia in 2000, but, you know, did, all, did the Skin Lab thing and all that. And then after Skin Lab, I quit. And I was like done with music, just burn out. Yeah. And, um, and, then, uh, and then just Billy called me like somewhere around 2002 or something and said, hey, or no, you know what? No, he didn't call. I called him <laughs> and I said, what's going on? Do you need anybody? Do you need anything? What's going on? He goes, I need a bass player. I said, fuck it, I'll play bass. And uh, so when I first joined MOD, I was a bass player. Yeah, right. And, yeah. And so, um, and I played bass and then, then a guitar player got fired and then I played guitar and then got a bass player <laughs> and then, uh, and then I quit MOD, you know, one time, um, and I was like, oh, I'm done. And, and that was after we did the record, the, uh, the, uh, what was it called? Uh, red, white and screwed record, yeah. which was in 2008, um, so my all that history. What's it like working with Billy Milano? The guy's one of my fucking best friends. We we're we're both ball busted bastards. He we still talk. He makes fun of me for this. I make fun of him for that. He called he he called me the other day, and, and this whole message on my voicemail was making horse sounds. <laughs> he didn't say a fucking word. He didn't say anything like "give me a call" or anything. It was just, <laughs> you know, and it was, that was the whole, the whole message. And um, so, yeah, man, uh, what it, it you know it it's it can be difficult to work together sometimes because we're both alphas, we're both you know stubborn and and we're both headstrong and we have our each of us have our own ideas. Um, so it can be difficult sometimes, but when I was in MOD, that was his band. Yeah. And I, and I always told him, I said, look, man, I go, you pay me what you pay me to do the touring. We do the record, you know, this is your band, you know? So I'm not going to argue with you when it comes to anything for your band. But if we ever did anything, you know, outside of MOD, which we've done too, we've written for some other projects together. And those can be a little difficult sometimes because he's like, I don't like that. That's wrong. No. And I'd be like, fuck you, motherfucker. This is how I'm fucking doing. <laughs> you know? and, and so, you know, we get into a little but we both respect each other. And, and, uh, and like I said, it's, this has been a, a friendship since 1989 and we're still fucking friends. And that's, that's pretty amazing. So. He's Scott, awesome. Fantastic. Scott Sargent, thank you for your time. Um, Click on the link below. Check out Tales of Ethereum. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it, man.